good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my name is Luigi Vizzo, and I'm presenting this work on uh, accelerating the network I.O. on uh, virtual machines. This is something I've done with my colleague uh, Giuseppe Lettieri and uh, student, former student uh, Vincenzo Maffione in Pisa. Uh, the pictures that you see here are on the left, my, the view from my office in Pisa, and on the right, another view uh, since I spent a few months in Mountain View in, uh, at Google. Uh, what is this work about? What are uh, our goals here? First of all, we wanted uh, to accelerate the network I.O. within uh, virtual machines. Uh, consider that uh, the typical packet rates that you can achieve uh, on FreeBSD, for instance, are about a million packets per second per core, and much less uh, uh, than line rate at 10 gigabit per second. This is on uh, bare metal, on real hardware, if you uh, in, in a virtual machine, performance is uh, 10 times worse, possibly even more than 10 times worse, uh, at least on FreeBSD. Um, so we wanted to find solution to uh, close the, the gap between these two performance levels. Uh, we wanted to accelerate a network IO not just for bulk uh, TCP connections, because uh, that's a problem that's relatively easier. Uh, we have large frames, uh, we have uh, TSO, uh, and hardware floats that uh, can relieve the, the, the work that is done on the CPU. So in a, in a way, you can get close to a uh, line rate at one gigabit and possibly even at 10 gigabits on a virtual machine using more or less uh, standard techniques and uh, perhaps uh, para-virtualized uh, device uh, drivers and devices. However, uh, there are more applications that uh, might be uh, interesting to run uh, to in, into virtual machines, such as software routers, middle boxes, uh, 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 applications that run, use uh, short-lived connections. And so we would like to to have uh, the same level of performance both on the, on the real hardware and the, on the virtual machine. The, there is another thing that uh, uh, when you approach virtual machine, uh, everybody tells you and uh, is uh, that device emulation is inherently slow. You cannot do uh, high-speed I.O. with uh, emulated NIC. You really need uh, some uh, sophisticated solution, uh, Xen, uh, Xen Front, Virt.io, VM XNet. Uh, actually, what we uh, find out, uh, what we found out, is that we got exactly the same result, and possibly slightly better, with an emulated uh, E1000 within a virtual machine. So at least uh, you probably don't need uh, a special device. And it's interesting that you don't need a special device uh, because uh, there are cases where perhaps uh, you have a well-established uh, data path, uh, uh, sorry, well-established uh, code base. Uh, that involves uh, your standard NIC driver, you'd rather exercise that one rather than a completely different uh, device driver that uh, you have no way to use uh, on, on, on the real hardware. And also, uh, doing our work, previous work on NetMap, the Valor Switch, uh, et cetera, we have uh, accumulated a few tricks that we would like to apply in, in other environments and see if they are effective. So that was a nice application for our previous work. The main tools that uh, we've been using are NetMap, uh, something that uh, was done a couple of years ago, presented uh, here at BSDCAN last year, and it's a framework for doing packet I.O. very, very fast. Uh, it is a standard part of FreeBSD now. There is a, a loadable module for, for Linux, and uh, you can do line rate uh, on a 10 gig interface very, very easily. Uh, a follow-up of this work was a Valet Switch, uh, which is basically an Ethernet, a software uh, Ethernet uh, bridge, uh, that uses the same API on ports uh, as uh, NetMap. Uh, it was designed as a generic interconnect, however, our, our goal was to use it uh, to interconnect virtual machines. And it's you, interesting for a number of applications, including um, testing uh, things that uh, you should run later on a 10 gig interface using NetMap. So you, you can really stress test your application even without hardware, and possibly even at a speeds faster than the 10 gigabit limitation that uh, uh, the, the NIC will uh, enforce. Uh, Valet uh, runs up to 20 million packets per second per port, or 70 gigabits per second with large uh, packets. Um, large, I mean 1,500 bytes. Um, the result that I'm presenting today is uh, an accelerated version of the QEMU and uh, uh, matching uh, patches for device drivers, both on FreeBSD and Linux, uh, that can achieve, uh, oh, that's interesting. that can achieve uh, uh, 
um, over a million packets per second when you're using standard socket applications in the, in the guest. This is guest-to-guest -guest, uh, communication and about six gigabits per second with 1500 byte frames uh, and over five million packets per second when uh, the clients, uh, so the, the, when the clients in the guest are using uh, uh, the NetMap API. Uh, the changes that uh, we have introduced in the device drivers and uh, in QAMO are really small, uh, the order of a few hundred lines uh, of code per subsystem. And that's uh, also a nice thing because it's easier to debug uh, small pieces of code rather than an entirely new device driver or an entirely new subsystem. The FreeBSD driver patches are about to be committed uh, uh, to the LAM uh, device driver. Uh, we have an equivalent thing for Linux and the QMO patches that are probably going to be <coughs> distributed as uh, uh, separate things uh, from our uh, website. So just a little bit of background. NetMap uh, and is an API to send and receive uh, raw frames from user space. It relies heavily on batching. Uh, packet buffers and uh, rings, the script of rings are, are exposed to user space with, through sh uh, shared memory revision. And you have a selectable file descriptor for synchronization, which means uh, NetMap is implemented with very small modifications to device drivers and uh, kernel module. And uh, there is a lipic up uh, library that is exported uh, of application. So in the best uh, case, uh, you don't even need to recompile your application. You just preload uh, uh, our version of the lipic up library and uh, you're off and using the, the faster uh, IO path to send and receive uh, traffic. <coughs> this uh, slide shows the basic uh, um, protocol to access uh, uh, NIC uh, using NetMap, uh, you open a, fi a special file, you get a file descriptor, issue <coughs> an IOCTL to bind the file descriptor to um, a given interface or something else, map the memory region and you're ready to, to send and receive packets and use uh, select uh, or poll for synchronization. Performance, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is really uh, good. Uh, in this graph uh, you see how, how fast you can send or receive packet using uh, one core, for instance, uh, at, uh, at less than one gigahertz, uh, you're already able to saturate a 10 gig link with uh, almost 50 million packets per second. And it scales pretty well with multiple uh, uh, cores, uh, up to four. Uh, I haven't tried more than that because I didn't have the hardware and also uh, because uh, at, at that point, uh, you're already saturating the network at 300 megahertz, so there's not much of a point <laughs> in going further. As a comparison, the internal uh, um, Packet gen generator in Linux uh, can do about uh, 4 million packets per second at uh, maximum speed. Uh, on FreeBSD or even on Linux using sockets, you're, you're running at about a million packets per second per core. Um, a follow-up to, to NetMap was to extend uh, the API <coughs> and uh, the kernel module to implement a virtual switch. So basically, uh, the, the NetMap module in FreeBSD now uh, is able to interpret uh, uh, port names uh, which, uh, of this form, uh, vale x and y, as a request uh, to create a, a virtual switch named x, a port named y on that virtual switch, and run the uh, Ethernet uh, learning bridge algorithm on that particular switch. You can create multiple switches, you can create multiple ports, and you can connect uh, uh, clients uh, using the NetMap API to a valid port in the same way as you can connect to um, a physical uh, NIC uh, working in NetMap mode. So you can test your application over a valid switch and then run over a uh, real interface, or these blocks could be virtual machines, uh, or, I mean, f the system is extremely flexible. Um, the operation is entirely sender driven and uh, each incoming packet is dispatched to one or more destinations, so the throughput uh, depends on how many copies of you uh, you need to do of the, of the packet. In terms of uh, performance, uh, uh, Vale, if you implemented Vale is, uh, uh, in a straightforward way, processing one packet at a time, and we have done this, uh, uh, you would only reach uh, between two and five million packets per second, which is not very fast. However, by exploiting batching and try to uh, reduce the, the, the access to locks uh, uh, so that you're sending, you're requesting one lock uh, for each batch per interface. Uh, uh, we managed to, to reach a, a throughput of about uh, uh, 18 to 20 million packets per second uh, with minimum size frames and uh, 70 gigabits per second with uh, larger frames. And uh, 70 gigabit per second is basically limited by the memory bandwidth of the system you're using. And these curves uh, show the performance of a valid switch. Uh, this is the top curve 
with vari uh, variable numbers of destination in the case of broadcast. Uh, this is the uh, time that is spent per packet, nanoseconds per packet, uh, depending on the packet size. Um, for the valley switch uh, and for the solution, for instance, this is the um, Linux bridge uh, using uh, uh, TAP uh, interfaces. Now, a little bit of background on virtual machines. Uh, um, probably the, in this room there's people who know more than me, but I apologize for mistakes and incorrectness. Um, what, what happens, uh, uh, how a uh, virtual machine uh, is implemented in uh, modern systems? Basically, uh, the uh, CPUs that we have these days can run uh, the, guest, the, the entire guest operating system on the actual CPU running in virtual mode. And each virtual CPU appears as a, a thread to the uh, host uh, operating system and machines. So you can uh, create a, a guest machine with multiple virtual CPU. They, uh, they are threads sharing the same uh, memory image. Um, there are things that cannot be done by the CPU in virtual mode, specifically when you need uh, to access uh, uh, registers or handle interrupts, etc. Sometimes uh, you need to exit from this virtual execution mode, uh, jump back to the real execution mode of the, uh, of the CPU. <coughs> and, uh, perform actions that, for instance, emulate the uh, peripherals that uh, you're trying to access and so on. These uh, VM exits uh, and uh, similar uh, things that happens on interrupt dispatching are actually very, very expensive, much more expensive than uh, on uh, uh, a real, uh, a real machine. Accessing a register is probably 100 nanoseconds or little more on a real machine, but uh, on, uh, on a virtual machine, uh, due to the uh, VM exits and uh, further processing, you might spend uh, anything between five and 10 microseconds uh, on that single operation. So there is a big gap in performance, uh, and uh, especially when uh, you are accessing devices, uh, there might be cases where you have a lot of these uh, accesses, accesses, of accesses uh, on, on each uh, packet. So if you are not careful in uh, emulating the device, or at least in writing the, the device driver in a way that is uh, performing well with the virtual machine, uh, you can get a very uh, high performance hit. Um, once, even if you solve the performance in the device emulation, there are still uh, possible bottlenecks in, uh, in the uh, host backend. Uh, for instance, uh, the connection on between uh, the uh, virtual machine and the uh, physical interface or another virtual machine goes through uh, several uh, uh, stages in the hypervisor and uh, in the kernel of the host operating systems. And uh, in, again, if, you, if you're not careful in uh, coding those, uh, uh, those uh, processing stages uh, um, very carefully, uh, you might end up doing expensive operation or redundant operation, copies, etc., that uh, uh, impact your performance uh, a lot. Of course, uh, if you start with a device driver uh, emulation, which is very expensive, that's the main bottleneck, and so you might even uh, you might not even see that uh, there are other other performance problems in your architecture. But doing this work, uh, we actually solved initially the device driver problem and then hit a number of uh, subsequent bottlenecks and then we try to solve all of them. So the paravirtualized device drivers, uh, uh, or sorry, paravirtualized peripherals that have been introduced uh, over time by uh, Xen, by VMware, and by QMO, the QMO forks, uh, try to uh, resolve the, to solve the problem of uh, an efficient uh, device model that uh, would, would work well uh, under uh, um, a hypervisor, under control of a hypervisor. And uh, however, those are only one part of the problem. Those solve only one part of the problem. The, all the other bottlenecks that I mentioned still exist. Um, and so they, uh, they need to be uh, dealt with in the hypervisor and in the software switch that connects the virtual machines uh, among themselves or to the physical NIC. So the, one of the things that we did uh, was uh, demystify the, the belief that uh, device emulation is slow. Um, because the, if when, once you look at the uh, paravirtualized device, uh, you see that the data representation in those devices, uh, packet buffers, ringers, et cetera, is not too different uh, from uh, what you have in a physical NIC. What, what is different is the way you access uh, uh, 
register or the equivalent of registers to, to get information on what is the, the current uh, uh, packet to transmit or the current uh, interrupt status, etc. But that can be addressed uh, without introducing a completely new uh, device model. Um, the, the, the real problem that uh, paravirtualized device uh, try to solve is to reduce the number of uh, virtual machine exits. And uh, as I mentioned, those are uh, related to uh, interrupts and uh, to uh, accesses to IO registers. So if you have a way to reduce the number of interrupts and perhaps replace access to registers with uh, information that is in a shared memory, uh, you can reduce this number of exits and, and get uh, decent uh, performance even with uh, an emulated E1000 or Realtek or similar devices. The second thing we did was uh, improve the, the, the throughput of the uh, hypervisor in uh, moving packets from between the front end and the back end. The front end is the emulated side of the network device. The back end is whatever uh, is used to connect the hypervisor to the host uh, um, network stack. However, if you have a, um, a more performant connection, a more performant back end, uh, you might still have uh, a slow uh, switch inside uh, the host, uh, which is what happens, uh, for instance, if you use uh, FreeBSD bridging or Linux bridging or OpenV switch. And so we were forced to uh, also uh, replace this, uh, this switch with uh, something uh, faster for, uh, to get better performance. Now, the first thing we did uh, was uh, uh, look at something that is already implemented in most uh, modern hardware, and it is uh, interrupt moderation. Instead of uh, especially uh, on the receive path. Instead of sending one interrupt on every, uh, on every packet uh, that you receive, uh, modern hardware tries to uh, enforce a minimum interval of time between interrupts uh, so that uh, you don't uh, um, cause too much overhead in the, in, the, in the processing of traffic. And the problem is that uh, most uh, um, emulated, most hypervisors don't really implement these features that exist in the hardware. We have seen that it doesn't exist in uh, QMO, it doesn't exist in VirtualBox, and of course we have no access to VMware, etc. But uh, according to what we have read, uh, moderation is not implemented there either. Uh, implementing uh, moderation is not terribly hard. Uh, the only, and the, the amount of code that it takes uh, is really limited. The only problem that exists is that uh, in order to implement uh, interrupt moderation, you need to set uh, some timers that uh, um, tell the hypervisor, okay, I'm not interrupting you now, but I'm interrupting you in 20 microseconds or 50 microseconds or something like that. That's the order of magnitude of the delays that are implemented by uh, real hardware. They're programmable, but basically those are the numbers that uh, you normally use. Now, Quite often, you don't have this uh, uh, fine-grained timer resolution in the, in the operating system, and that might be a reason why uh, moderation wasn't uh, implemented in the first place. Anyways, we implemented that and, and tried to, to use that, and uh, uh, we will see some performance number, and also um, we will show that uh, moderation by itself is not necessarily uh, solving the, the performance problem. And in fact, uh, here are the numbers uh, in uh, one, of, uh, one set of experiments that we made. Uh, the, the type of experiments that uh, I'm reporting are uh, basically uh, using uh, KVM and QMO as a hypervisor running on top of Linux. Uh, Linux because we don't have KVM on FreeBSD, so we cannot really use uh, hardware support for virtualization. Um, we had uh, two guests, uh, which are FreeBSD had as of uh, February, more or less. Uh, those are PicoBSD builds, so standalone images. And they are connected uh, through either TAP interfaces, uh, as in uh, this particular experiment, or through a valid switch, uh, as uh, we will see uh, later. And they're running on the, on the same machine, which is a, um, has a 3 gigahertz, uh, about 3 or 3.2 gigahertz uh, CPU. So if we take an unmodified uh, QMO and uh, we run, um, we try to measure the uh, guest uh, to guest uh, throughput, uh, the transmit rate is actually very, uh, very low. It's about uh, 24,000 packets uh, per second on uh, one virtual CPU. And if you have two virtual CPU, you get a transmit rate of, of about 65,000 packets per second. <clears throat> By implementing uh, interrupt moderation, um, we actually get uh, a little bit of improvement, well, quite 
a substantial improvement, but we are still dealing with very low packet rates in absolute terms. We moved from 24 to 80,000 packets per second with one virtual CPU, and uh, from 65 to 87 with two. So why is that, uh, uh, that for two virtual CPU the improvement is so, uh, so modest? Well, the, the thing is, um, without inter interrupt moderation, when you try to transmit a packet, uh, the, uh, the guest uh, uh, virtual CPU does a VM exit, uh, transmits the packet, and immediately generates an interrupt. And so by the time you return uh, control to the uh, guest operating system, you are hit by the interrupt and you have to uh, serve the interrupt immediately. And so that's the source of overhead. In the case of two virtual CPUs, uh, when, when you do the exit and, and return, uh, one of the CPU will serve the interrupt and the other one will be able to continue processing of, of, uh, of your traffic. So you have a little bit of parallelism going on and that per permits uh, a little bit more batching and, and performance improvement. Um, so having, uh, having the uh, interrupt moderation changes the situation for the one CPU case, but it doesn't change the situation too much for the two virtual CPU case. On the, on the receive side, uh, we didn't see a lot of improvement with interrupt moderation, but this is mostly uh, because of the uh, test configuration that, uh, that we used. Uh, basically, the sender itself uh, transmit packets in batches to the, uh, to the other virtual machine, and so even without uh, interrupt moderation, you are still getting batches of packets on the receive side, and not just one interrupt per, per packet. Uh, on these numbers are on FreeBSD and are pretty interesting. Uh, receive side is faster than the transmit side. We, we didn't even manage to uh, get uh, receive live lock instead on, on the using Linux as a guest operating system. We uh, actually had uh, some live lock uh, cases, but those really depends on the operating system. The second technique that uh, we use was, is called uh, send combining. It's actually a very old thing. It, uh, I was reading a paper, 2011 paper from VMware, where they documented, uh, probably for the first time, the techniques that they used in the, uh, their initial uh, emulators back in the late 90s. And uh, they use a similar technique. The idea is uh, whenever uh, you have a pending transmission, uh, sorry, whenever you want to transmit a packet, you write to a register in the, in the NIC to, to tell uh, the hardware, if you have the hardware, or the um, hypervisor, if you are on a virtual machine, that you want to send out a packet. And that write to the register is very expensive. It's, it is what causes a DM exit. Now, in, in case uh, you are uh, requesting an interrupt at the completion of the, of the packet, then you, you can uh, forget, uh, uh, you can postpone writing to the register for subsequent uh, packet transmission uh, requests. And instead, just remember that there are pending transmissions uh, to, to, to be sent out. And when you get the interrupt, you do the actual write to the register. So that batches uh, writes to the register and reduces the number by a significant amount, especially if you have interrupt moderation, of course. If you don't have interrupt moderation, you will get an interrupt immediately here after, after sending this, uh, this request. Um, in terms of performance, <coughs> uh, you see here, again, the implementation of uh, uh, send combining uh, requires a very modest amount of code, uh, and it's only in the guest device drivers. So you don't even need to, to modify the hypervisor. Um, whereas the uh, interrupt moderation only needs to modify the hypervisor, uh, assuming that the operating system supports the, the feature. Um, so, with moderation and uh, one uh, virtual CPU, these are the numbers that I showed in the previous slide. With SEN combining alone, without interrupt moderation, you basically have no gain in the case of one virtual CPU. You have a significant uh, gain in the case of uh, two virtual CPUs. And if you have both interrupt moderation and SEN combining, the, the speed up uh, in the one virtual CPU case is impressive, and two virtual CPUs goes uh, about at the same speed. Just because you have reduced the interrupt load uh, by a large factor and the uh, uh, number of VM exits by a large factor, and so the second CPU in this particular test is doing almost nothing, because basically it's just serving interrupts, and the main CPU is doing the, uh, most of the work. So we have a tenfold speed up in the case of uh, 15 uh, times speed up in the case of one virtual CPU, five times faster in, with the two virtual CPU. And we are approaching pretty decent uh, uh, packet rates on the, on the transmit side. Uh, inter, uh, send combining only works on the transmit side. 
So the next step uh, we, we tried to, uh, the next thing we tried to implement was uh, paravirtualization. And the idea of paravirtualization is to uh, reduce the number of VM exits by making the um, host and the guest communicate through shared memory instead of uh, communicating through uh, interrupts and uh, writes to registers. Uh, of course, in order to communicate through shared memories, uh, given that you have no synchronization mechanism, you need that uh, both entities are active at the same time. So you need to, and, and you cannot afford to have uh, some thread in the host per month always running and, and polling uh, the status of, uh, of some shared memory because that would be too expensive. So the way it works uh, is that uh, you start uh, from uh, initial state where both the guest and the host are idle, and then uh, whenever uh, one of the two entities want to start this uh, uh, communication, sends a, a message which is called a kick. A kick uh, from the guest to the host is typically sent uh, by writing to a register, because the register causes, causes a VM exit, and so you transfer control to the host and you can do operation in the context of the host. A kick in the other direction is typically sent through an interrupt uh, because that's the way the host can communicate to, to the guest operating system and, uh, and tell it to start, for instance, a polling thread of, uh, of some kind. So what we uh, implemented uh, to, to uh, do the paravirtualization of uh, the E1000 device uh, was to uh, mo slightly modify the hypervisor so that the write to the uh, transmit uh, register, the TDT, how is it? Uh, is the name of the register on the 1000. Um, also uh, is interpreted as a kick by the uh, hypervisor. And interrupts uh, also uh, generate uh, some, uh, um, are interpreted by kicks uh, by, by the guest operating system. Uh, the region that uh, is used to exchange information, uh, we call that uh, um, common status block or C CSP. And basically, uh, the, the, it, it contains a, a couple of uh, pointer or indexes uh, uh, for each direction of the communication. So after the kick, uh, what happens is that, for instance, if you are transmitting, the, uh, the guest will write in a, in a shadow register, which is actually a memory location, which reflects the value of the transmit uh, uh, register on, uh, on the transmit ring. And the host uh, will poll the content of this shared memory location to see if there are more packets to be transmitted or not. As long as there are packet, new packets to be transmitted, there is no need to write to a register in order to send them out. The, the uh, polling loop on the host uh, will fetch the uh, packets from the uh, buffers and, uh, and send them to the uh, backend, whatever it is and uh, will notify completion uh, to another uh, shadow register in the, um, in the CSB. And of course, uh, there is already an implicit notification through status bits in the, in the, um, in the ring of the scriptors that uh, is used by the NIC. And the same happens in the other direction. When uh, you have a new packet coming in and everything is idle, you send an interrupt, the guest uh, starts uh, processing data, but instead of uh, uh, reading uh, from um, the status register, if any, to, to get information on whether or not there are more packets, it will just get information from the ring or from the CSP. And this way, it doesn't need to access uh, uh, registers. And also, when the guest on the receive side frees buffer and returns them to, uh, to the NIC uh, to perform more receptions, it doesn't do it uh, uh, through uh, registers, but uh, just writes the information in the uh, CSP. Again, another very small change to both the guest and the host side, about 100 lines each, and the uh, performance gains uh, are also impressive in this case. Uh, in order to use power virtualization, we don't need uh, any um, interrupt moderation or send combining. And uh, you see that uh, we approach half a million packets per second uh, on FreeBSD, both with one and two virtual CPUs. Um, so now we get uh, to a level of performance which is uh, perfectly equivalent to that of Vitaio, uh, with uh, using a more or less standard uh, E1000 device drivers, device driver. Um, now, how can we go faster than this? Uh, this is basically the throughput of the uh, switch, uh, uh, Linux bridge or whatever, using the TAP interface uh, um, as a communication channel. So we need to improve uh, that part of the system. And that part of the system um, involves uh, 
using a faster virtual switch uh, as a, at the bottom interconnecting the two virtual machines. And uh, the valet switch is a perfect uh, uh, thing to, to use in this particular case. Uh, all we needed to do is to write a backend for uh, QMU to, inter to talk to the valet switch instead of the uh, TAP interfaces or other mechanism that uh, QMU has. And QMU code is quite modular, so it wasn't a difficult task, about 350 lines of code. And uh, another advantage of using this approach is that uh, we can connect now a QMU instance directly to a, to a NIC using the NetMap API, so we can do almost line rate uh, uh, without too much uh, difficulty. However, just improving uh, uh, the switch didn't get us uh, uh, much performance improvement because, in fact, the data path within the hypervisor uh, was really slow. And uh, this figure shows you uh, what happens uh, in the communication between uh, the uh, guest and the uh, software switch at the bottom. The, the standard uh, uh, QMO implementation uh, basically consumed about 200 nanoseconds to copy uh, data from uh, the buffers. Uh, w this is the time, amortized time per packet. Consume about 100 nanoseconds to copy the data <coughs> from the uh, buffers that are supplied by the guest operating system into the front end, then another 80 nanoseconds to transfer them to the back end, and another 500 nanoseconds per system call, because uh, using the TAP interface, you can only send one packet per system call. So we had to clean up uh, this data path in order to get, to get uh, better performance. And that was done by um, noting that, uh, for instance, part of these 200 nanoseconds was due to the fact that for every access to the uh, descriptor, uh, there was a call to the routine that mapped the uh, host physical, uh, guest physical addresses into uh, host virtual addresses. Now this mapping is there forever until the uh, guest machine, virtual machine migrates to somewhere else. So, so there is absolutely no need to repeat the check every time. So we just cache the, the result and uh, reduce this time by uh, four times. Then the data copy, the data copy was done using more or less mem copy, which is quite slow. And um, so we, we replaced that uh, with an optimized uh, copy routine, which also uh, used the same trick that we use in NetMap and Vale. Uh, instead of trying to copy exactly the number of bytes that you have, like six, 65 or some odd number, uh, we just round the number to multiple of 32 or 64, which makes the entire process a lot more uh, efficient. And so reduces time from 80 to 40 nanoseconds. And then uh, by replacing the um, backend uh, with the valid switch, we got an amortized time of about 50 nanoseconds per packet uh, in, in the last uh, part of, the, of this path. So now the interconnection between the guest and the switch is a lot faster and we were able to push uh, packets uh, up to this point uh, at about uh, 10 million packets per second. And then going to the switch, uh, mm, we have, of course, a slight reduction in performance, but uh, uh, still pretty fast. Overall, uh, and this is almost the final uh, table uh, that uh, I have to show you, um, this is the performance uh, uh, using uh, uh, TAP and Linux Bridge uh, as, a, as a switch interconnecting virtual machine in the various configuration. So you see that we started from uh, about 24,000 packets per second in the worst case, standard case with one virtual CPU, and we got to uh, between three and 400,000 packets per second, or 500,000 packets per second, depending on the type of optimization that uh, we implemented. This number here, high TR, is the uh, delay that uh, we used in the, the uh, interrupt moderation. And it is in microseconds, I believe. So a delay of one micro, of course, I mean, these delays are nominal, but when you implement them in the, uh, in the operating system, the, there is some granularity in the, in the timer. So you don't really have one microseconds, you have probably much larger uh, delays. Um, the problem is that uh, increasing the um, interrupt moderation improves performance, but uh, uh, it has an impact on the latency of uh, your, your path, and so it might be uh, something that you don't want to do uh, if you have, uh, if, if you want low latency or high, high throughput uh, with the small window sizes. And here is the uh, situation in red. If you use uh, uh, the valet switch as a backend with all the uh, improvements that uh, we included in, in the system. So you see that we almost doubled the, the performance, the peak 
performance and reaches mm, these uh, million packets per second in the case of paravirtualization. But even without paravirtualization, we are getting pretty close, between eight and 900,000 packets per second. This again, this test is done between two FreeBSD uh, guests uh, using NetSend and NetReceive. Uh, uh, these are part of tools, tools, NetRate, uh, for, for sending and receiving UDP packets. And it is, uh, this, these numbers are for 64 byte packets. Uh, with uh, 1,500 byte frames, uh, we reach about half a million packets per second, uh, which uh, amounts to five or six uh, gigabits per second, I think. And uh, now, what happens if uh, we use NetMap within the guest instead of using a, a socket-based application to send and receive data? Of course, in order to use NetMap, you need uh, a NetMap-capable net um, NIC. Unfortunately, E1000 is one of the NICs that are supported by NetMap. So it was uh, just a matter of running the test and see how fast it went. And uh, the kind of throughput that we reached was about 5 million packets per second, guest to guest again. So it's pretty fast. And between uh, uh, sender and in terms of absolute throughput uh, with 1500 byte packets, we do about 25 gigabit per second on the receive side and slightly faster on the transmit side. So I think that uh, this is the kind of performance that uh, is really comparable with what we can achieve on, on the hardware. Of course, not on the E1000, which is a one gigabit interface, but for instance, on the 10 gig interface, uh, IFGBA um, or others, uh, we are pretty much uh, close to this value. Now, what's the status of this uh, stuff? There are three sets of changes involved. Uh, one is on the guest operating systems, um, and we have patches for uh, uh, the E1000 device on uh, FreeBSD that are going to be committed soon. I'm talking to Jack uh, Vogel uh, about uh, including them in our software. And uh, I think I've lost the microphone. No. Okay. And uh, there are also changes for uh, the Linux C1000 driver, uh, the same. Uh, since the mechanism for power virtualization is completely general, we are actually using the same data structure to, to do power virtualization of the uh, Realtek uh, device, which is not particularly interesting, but um, some hypervisor implement Realtek and not E1000, so why not try that? On the hypervisor, we have a QMO backend for NetMap that we sent to the QMO list uh, a few months ago. We are improving that uh, while it gets uh, accepted or uh, rejected or whatever. But anyways, uh, uh, we, we can surely include that uh, as a patch in our FreeBSD port of uh, QMO. Um, again, the changes that we are making uh, on the hypervisor are completely general. So for instance, uh, it is feasible to write a backend for VirtualBox and if you don't want to run um, QM or if, if you want a, a FreeBSD solution that has uh, uh, support for uh, power virtualization in the, in the CPU. And on the host side, uh, this is not really a change. There's, there's nothing to change. All you need is to load the, the NetMap, or Valley, uh, NetMap and Valley module, uh, which is just a matter of recompiling it on FreeBSD and on Linux. So as a conclusion for, uh, for this thing is that uh, I believe we uh, we have uh, uh, reached a point where we can get uh, about the same performance uh, for network I.O. on the virtual machine as on the real hardware. And that's great because, for instance, if you want to test uh, uh, optimization of the protocol stack now, you can do them on, uh, on a virtual machine very, very easily without uh, having to worry about uh, uh, the performance of the uh, final part of the path, the NIC and uh, the switch, etc. And I hope that uh, this uh, this tool will uh, help us uh, improve the, the network stack on FreeBSD. Um, this work has been done with a uh, uh, contribution by uh, my students um, listed here and funding from uh, some European project and also companies, uh, NetApp and Google, who supported my stay at uh, Mountain View. Uh, I'd like to conclude with a few uh, comments on uh, uh, the status of uh, NetMap and, and the Valley Switch since uh, uh, last year. So last uh, summer in August, uh, uh, I tried to implement a user space version of uh, APFW and Daminet, uh, which uh, talks to NetMap uh, interfaces uh, rather, than to, uh, rather than being embedded in the kernel. And uh, the filtering performance of this thing is pretty uh, 
pretty good. Uh, between uh, two valid switches, uh, a single CPU can filter about 6 million packets per second. And I have reports from a user who said uh, he, uh, he can do about 10 million packets per second between two physical interfaces. So connecting the in, in user space IPFW uh, to uh, two physical interfaces uh, running uh, uh, valid. If we, are, we use Daminet, uh, there is an additional data copy involved. Uh, uh, and, um, and that reduces the performance to uh, between 2 and 3 million packets per second. But that's uh, still much faster than the internal version. Um, another thing that we implemented in, uh, in February was a transparent mode for NetMap. So one of the issues with NetMap is that uh, you basically, your application grabs the interface and disconnects it from the host stack. So uh, the only way for traffic to reach the host stack is that uh, your application rejects the traffic using another NetMap um, file descriptor into the host stack. Uh, with transparent mode, uh, an application using NetMap can, as a chance to, to, see, to see packets, uh, mark those packets that uh, should be intercepted by the application itself, and all the others can go, are automatically forwarded to the host stack. And the same goes for the other direction. So that makes the behavior of um, NetMap uh, a lot more similar to what you have on BPF, with the additional ability to filter out packets, which might be interesting in, in some cases. Um, Miki Onda, a colleague from NEC in Europe, um, started working on uh, NetMap recently, and uh, in April implemented a feature that uh, allows you to hook uh, network interfaces to a valid switch. So basically now you have the same uh, um, abilities that uh, you have uh, with an uh, internal bridge to attach interfaces to a switch or to the host stack and move traffic uh, between, between ports uh, completely transparently without uh, any, any user space process that uh, does the, the switching for you. And this should be committed uh, to, to FreeBSD shortly. Um, there is an uh, ongoing work to use the Valley switch as the data path for uh, OpenV switch. This uh, initially will be a Linux only thing because the internal version of OpenV switch only runs on Linux at the moment. And uh, I've been discussing with some of you uh, the option to support uh, scat scattergather IO on, um, on NetMap. And that uh, is useful for a number of things. Uh, for instance, it helps uh, implementing uh, uh, software version of DSO. Uh, it helps uh, from orientation and reassembly if you want to move traffic to a switch with uh, different MTUs on, uh, on the various ports. So that's all for now. Um, if you have questions, uh, I'll be glad to answer. Yes? No, absolutely nothing. Uh, I, no, in general, I, I try to, to avoid uh, uh, the use of features that are specific to uh, operating system or hardware version, etc., because that makes my work more, more portable. <coughs> okay, I guess I killed you. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't have I don't have numbers on latency so far. Mm. Yes, definitely yes. Uh, uh, one thing I have to say, um, I don't think I have a figure here, but um, uh, in terms of latency, one thing that kills you is the fact that uh, uh, when you transmit a packet, uh, you um, you need to, to send the packet back to the uh, user space thread in order to communicate with the backend. Now, uh, Linux has, for instance, some optimization uh, with the VHOST thing. So on a VM exit, uh, the packet is sent directly to the network stack, uh, whatever it is, uh, without going through the user space process. And that's the way one should do things in order to reduce the, the latency. You have a question? To some degree. Uh, but as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And that directly refers back to this case that I have. But then you're referring to the fact that it takes about 100 lines of additional 
code in the client device driver to implement this. That is true. That is true. Now, um, it is partly true. I mean, it is partly true. For instance, uh, um, e the, the interrupt moderation, and where, where is the slide with performance? The interrupt moderation uh, doesn't need any change in the client because the client typically already has an interrupt moderation. So the, the kind of uh, gains uh, that you can get are here. Not very much, though. So if I have a client that I cannot modify, mm. Yes. That requires client side changes. Mm -hmm. The Veil code could theoretically replace the native bridging code. Yes. So, you, yeah, naturally, that's true. You could get up to, in our test case, you could get uh, up to 140,000 packets per second from the original 65. Which is not a lot. I mean, it's a factor of two. Uh, of course, when you're used to see <laughs> numbers that are a factor of 10, a factor of two doesn't seem a lot. But. So, mm. the veil code could make a difference yes. to speed, well, definitely. And the interrupt moderation would make a difference to speed. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the best thing is when you can uh, combine interrupt moderation with send combining, at least on the, on the transmit side, or you can do power virtualization. But that, of course, requires some changes on the, on, the, on the guest side. Now, my point is, uh, it is easier to add 100 lines of code, uh, assuming you have uh, ability to, to change a little bit on the, on the guest side. It, it might be easier to add uh, 100 lines of code than, than to write an entirely new device driver. Unfortunately, Unfortunately not for you. <laughs> Something can be done there, yes. <laughs> well, probably there are other bottlenecks on, on your system, given that it's so old uh, amount. Mm. Okay, we're on time. <laughs>